Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation in the Voices of Freedom online lecture series, Abolition in Britain, Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce. I'm Peter Sonsky from the Knights of Columbus Museum, and I thank you for joining this session, which is uh, being recorded. A few notes to begin. This is the first of three presentations. The next two are April 23rd and April 30th, a week and two weeks from today, both again at 2 p.m. And details of each of these presentations are at kofcmuseum.org under the events section. This is our first online presentation, so I would beg your uh, pardon for any hiccups that happen along the way. For any of you who are students assigned to complete the quiz at the conclusion of the presentation, you'll find it in the handout section. And then for all participants, feel free to use the questions section to submit your questions, which uh, we will take up at the end of the session. And I expect this presentation to last approximately 30 minutes. So with that, our presenter is no stranger to the Knights of Columbus Museum. She's presented uh, in person at the museum on multiple occasions, but is our inaugural online lecturer. She is the director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University, Dr. Christine Keneally. Christine, welcome. Hello. I turn the meeting over to you. Okay. Um, hello. I, okay, show my screen. Okay, I hope my screen is now becoming visible to you. You are not visible to me. All I can see is my screen. So, Peter, thank you for being so creative and thoughtful as to organize these series. I'm delighted to be the inaugural lecturer. Um, as Peter said, there might be hiccups. We are all in a new world. I haven't done this before. Um, it's an experiment. There might be hiccups. I hope there aren't, but please um, just bear with us and be kind. That's all I can say. So as Peter said, I am Christine Keneally. I'm an Irish historian and I'm director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. As you can probably see, I'm now in my home. My son is visiting, so I have to keep the scarf and gloves just in case. I also have a mask. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that now. So I have a dog. He is in isolation with me. So if you hear a barking, he's usually very quiet, just so you know, not to panic. Anyway, um, my research interest has traditionally been Ireland's Great Hunger, the Famine, and I continue to be very interested in that. But then a few years ago, I got very interested in an Irish national hero, Daniel O'Connell. And through my research on Daniel O'Connell, I got to learn that he in turn was inspirational to a young fugitive black abolitionist. I'm sure you've all heard of the great Frederick Douglass. And so that led me to Frederick Douglass. And so for the past 10 years, probably, I've been doing research on Frederick Douglass and his relationship with Ireland. And that got me really interested in the wider issue of abolition, particularly transatlantic abolition, because it's really hard to separate British, Irish, and American abolitionists. They were also interconnected and intertwined, and they really stimulated and supported each other. So it's sort of very exciting, but you, my perspective always is as really an Irish historian who is interested in the bigger picture. So today, for the inaugural lecture, I want to look at the bigger picture. And this really is inspired by something in the collection at the Knights of Columbus Museum, and I hope you get a chance to visit it. It's a publication by one of the men I want to speak about today, Thomas Clarkson. And if you know anything about British abolition, you probably have heard of William Wilberforce. But Thomas Clarkson was the man who brought William Wilberforce into the movement. So I'm going to talk about as they were called, the Apostles of British Abolition. And I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes, and then there will be time for maybe a few questions at the end. So let's start. 
We were all familiar with the slave trade. It's something that has defined America, but it's really defined the world. And I hope you can see an image. It was often referred to as the triangular trade because people and slave people would be forcibly brought from Africa. They would be taken to North America, to South America, to the West Indies, now the Caribbean. And the main beneficiaries were European countries. So that is the triangle of the slave trade. And for those poor people who were forced to be part of it, they had a horrendous journey and it was called the Middle Passage. And again, these images might be familiar to you of people being crowded in really inhumanitarian conditions on these ships. And their lives were valued so little that if they died, they were simply thrown overboard. For Britain, had a dual role, in some ways a paradoxical role. So Britain was a main beneficiary from the slave trade and it's been estimated between 1700 and 1810 she was involved in exporting three million Africans to the Americas, the New World as they were, it, they were then called. But also, and this is part of the paradox, as this slave trade was reaching its apex and was increasingly um, profitable, Britain also was home to an incredibly successful organised abolition movement. So that is Britain's dual role, which at times doesn't sit easily. And for historians, you're trying to understand this. It's sort of difficult to see how Britain led the way in the slave trade, yet also led the way in the abolition movement. So it is a paradox, but we'll try and understand a bit more of it today. So propaganda, in any conflict, propaganda is always a massive weapon. And this is an 18th century image and images are always in some ways more powerful than words. And this image tries to show that the poor working family in Britain were worse off than the happy, well-fed, well cared for slaves in other parts of the British Empire. And I think this image speaks for itself. It tells you how people who were pro-slavery presented themselves. They were kind, they were paternalistic, they were benign to their slaves. Being a slave was no hardship. Of course, we know that wasn't true. And one thing that historians are increasingly aware of is the role that enslaved people played in freeing themselves. Traditionally, it was represented that enslaved people were liberated by white abolitionists and we know it's more complex. Today I'm going to talk about white abolitionists in Britain but I will later on the series talk about black abolitionists. So just to expose you to a few ideas, um, black slaves like everybody else were really inspired by the American Revolution, by the French Revolution and by those ideas of liberty, equality, everybody being equal. So why weren't they equal? But one of the first revolutions to occur, which was instigated by black people, by enslaved people, took place in Haiti. And Haiti was a colony of France. And France, despite its own revolution, wasn't too happy. And again, later in the series, I'll maybe talk about Haiti, because Haiti, for Frederick Douglass, was an example of what a black republic could be. There were other slave revolts, mostly in the West Indies, and each time there was a revolt, it was brutally, brutally put down. But some enslaved people did escape, and apart from lecturing, one of the most valuable things they did was they wrote their life story. It was a genre called slave narratives. The most famous is the narrative of Frederick Douglass, but many other slaves wrote their narratives. And as a result of this, we had a glimpse into the cruelties of slavery and from the perspective of somebody who had actually endured it, not from the perspective of a white abolitionist. So slave narratives are very powerful. And if you haven't read any of them, I would urge you to, to hear people speak in their own voice. So, how did abolition come about? 
and it came about in various stages and both men and women were very involved in it. Women, this time of history, the 18th century, tend to be invisible, but women were the backbone of the abolition movement. And one of the things they did was to encourage people, especially men, not to purchase anything that was slave produced. And that was sugar, that was rum, increasingly cotton goods. So they were very much behind that movement, not to consume slave sugar. So you may know of the song Amazing Grace, and it's particularly inspirational. What you might not know, it was written by an Englishman, John Newton, who was actually involved in the slave trade. But at one point, his ship was in violent storm and he was shipwrecked. And where was he shipwrecked to? The northwest of Ireland in County Donegal, if any of you know that area. And while he was there, because his life had been saved in such a dramatic way, he underwent a conversion. And he, he changed from being a supporter of slavery to being an opponent of slavery. And he penned down some words, a beautiful hymn that summed up his amazing grace. I once was blind, but now I see. And part of the sad irony of this is that in his later life, John Newton did become blind. And if you want to know more about John Newton and about this generation of British abolitionists, I would recommend you watch a film that was made in 2007, which is actually called Amazing Grace. And it centers around the characters of Wilberforce and his friend, the Prime Minister, William Pitt. But John Newton is in it, as is a former slave, Equiano, who we will talk about. Uh, Peter, I don't know if we have the clip or if that's expecting too much on our first outing. Christine, thank you for asking. Uh, I have uploaded it, but uh, I think the first hiccup is that I am unable to find it in my control panel to share right now. Okay, so, so I'm going to, to continue. It. Thank you. Okay, so people, um, at the end, I have suggested reading, viewing, listening, and the link to it is there. And it is just an incredible film. Some of you might know one of the main actors in it, Benedict Cumberbatch. He's pretty famous and he is excellent in this role. That sign is actually in County Donegal. So if you go to Ireland, you can visit Amazing Grace Country. That is where it all started. So back to Thomas Clark. In 1786, he published what was really um, a watershed essay, essay on the slavery and commerce of the human species. And he had collected many facts and he used his great intellect to try and present an intellectual argument to say why it was wrong to enslave a fellow human being. And his book had a great, great impact. And one of its main legacies was that in the next year, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was formed. And again, as I said, this became one of the most organized, effective mass movements ever. So this was incredible. And this organization had a structure, a fundraising system. It ran newspaper articles. It understood the power of press, of media, etc. And as I said, it involved both men and women. And this cause, abolition, was one of the few areas that women were allowed to be involved in the public sphere. In general, it was believed a woman's place was in the home, but in terms of abolition and philanthropy, women could coexist with men. So this society was founded in London and it was founded by 12 men. The women were there, but it was founded by 12 men. And mostly they were actually Quakers, nonconformists, or evangelicals. And because of their religious beliefs, and because of their religious beliefs, they saw slavery as being a sin against God, but they were given the nickname the Apostles. So the two major apostles were people will speak about today, Thomas Clarkson, who, as I told you, um, was a person who was very influential through his writings and it was he who persuaded William Wilberforce to come into the movement and even though Thomas Clarkson was such a powerful figure he tends to have been overshadowed by William Wilberforce 
but he was traveling agent for the society and as such he traveled thousands of miles promoting the message of abolition and that slavery was a sin against god William Wilberforce was slightly different because he used his position as a member of the British Parliament to constantly bring the attention of the government to the injustice of slavery. And again, even though he was greatly outnumbered, he was very, very effective. So just to look more at Thomas Clark then, he was born in England. Uh, he was the son of an Anglican minister, which helped shape his of evangelical views and he viewed ending slavery as part of a spiritual mission he believed it was his destiny to do this and he traveled throughout the country promoting this message and as all abolitionists were he was often physically attacked brutally attacked so it wasn't an easy choice he brought wilberforce into the movement and he wanted to educate himself about africa he knew slavery was wrong, but he wanted to know more about African culture and traditions. And so he learned a great deal and he actually collected some artifacts from Africa. And the box you see, I hope on the screen, was a box he carried with him. And it was his traveling display box and he would show people the spices, some of the artwork of Africa to show what a deeply sophisticated society they were. So again, a very powerful, in some ways simple but powerful tool. Back to Wilberforce. Wilberforce, this is in the British Parliament, lobbied to end slavery. And the main way in which he did it was by getting mass petitions. Again, he was helped by Clarkson. And he would introduce these petitions, he would roll them out on the floor of the British Parliament as a way of showing that public opinion was opposed to slavery. And in 1791, he introduced the first bill in the British Parliament to end the slave trade. And this is an important distinction to end the slave trade, not to end slavery. The early generation of abolitionists believed that if this cruel slave trade could be ended, slavery itself would implode, that it couldn't survive unless it was constantly replenished. So their agitation was to end the slave trade that we talked about. The bill was introduced in 1791 and it was defeated. Sort of badly, it was defeated by 163 votes to 88. And if you do get a chance to see the film Amazing Grace, you see this acted out in a very dramatic form. So again, very, very powerful. So as I said, women were active in this society and it was really women as the backbone who organized the petitions, boycotting slave produce, writing literature, they wrote poetry, and they saw pins as a way of raising funds for the society. And this is an image you might be very familiar with, it's quite iconic. And it was designed by one of the main supporters of the abolition movement, a man called Josiah Wedgwood. He was an English potter. And so this image, which now is seen as being slightly offensive of the supplicant enslaved person, but the slogan was, am I not a man and a brother? And that became the slogan of the abolition movement. And then when the women got involved, they said, well, how about the women who are slaves? And so they had their own pin, am I not a woman and a sister? And even though we might not like this image now, it was very, very powerful. And it was a very effective way of raising funds. People could buy it on their ties, as pins, on mugs, et cetera, little cups and saucers. So as this movement is at its height, they recruit somebody who'd been a former slave. And that was a very, very powerful tool for the abolition movement. And this young man is just incredible, Udala Equiano, after Frederick Douglass, maybe the most famous black abolitionist. So Equiano, as was his birth name, was born in Africa about 1745. Of course, the dates, nobody knew the actual dates. As a young child, he and his sister were captured, taken on the Middle Passage. But because he was a promising young man, he was actually adopted by a sea captain, who, even though he's his slave, took him to sea. And Equiano was a very skilled slave, sailor, and he was able to purchase his way out of slavery. And again, this is an unusual story. 
But as a free man, he decided he wanted to settle in England because he knew if he went to any part of America, he would be re-enslaved. So after he purchased his freedom, he came to England and he immediately joined the abolition movement. And his presence, his compelling life story, energized the movement. And like Clarkson, he traveled all over the country. He lectured in Ireland in 1791, and while in Ireland, he became committed as an Irish supporter of independence. So he wasn't just concerned with his own story, with his own people. He actually saw the ending of abolition as a larger voice. Um, this series is called Voice for Freedom, and he really became a voice for freedom. For whatever there was oppression, he wanted it to be ended. He wrote his own narrative of his life, and it was really regarded as the first successful slave narrative. And out of that, he was able to make a nice living. Um, he married an English woman. They had two young daughters. And then suddenly he disappears from public life in the middle of the 1790s. But he had made such a tremendous contribution to the abolition movement. And just sadly, we do not know where he is buried. But there are many plaques to this remarkable man in London today. And just his narrative, again, if you haven't read a narrative, I would urge you to read it. And that is the original edition. And then as he said, I'm neither a saint, a hero, nor a tyrant. And sort of a very powerful statement of how he regarded himself. Um, this was regarded as the first slave narrative. It sold out, so there were eight editions, and each edition was expanded. And um, there were two volumes that became so big. And he survived by touring through Britain and Ireland to sell his narrative. And he also was a very um, skilled lecturer. We have some newspaper accounts which are very flattering about his ability and very charming. And so again, you, you can imagine what uh, attribute he was to the abolition movement. And as I said, he disappeared from public view in the mid 1790s, unfortunately. So, all this agitation, where does it take us to? I told you William Wilberforce introduced his first petition and his first bill in Parliament in 1791. It was unsuccessful, but he didn't give up. And despite ill health, and he always suffered from ill health every single year after that, he introduced a bill into Parliament to end the slave trade. And finally, in 1807, the British Parliament agreed it would be ended. And again, this is one of the quirks of history. In 1800, the Irish Parliament had been forced to end its existence in Dublin, and Irish MPs instead came and sat in the London Parliament. And they were almost exclusively against the slave trade. And so the presence of these Irish politicians actually helped to strengthen the abolition movement. So as a result of their involvement in 1807, an act was passed to end the slave trade within the British Empire. And in the same year, the American Congress also outlawed the slave trade. So two very important victories. Other Europeans continued to be involved in it, but they were increasingly policed by Britain. But unfortunately, slave trade ended, but the practice of slavery continued and it didn't come to an end. It seemed to be getting stronger in the early decades of the 19th century. So in 1823, a number of people gathered their forces again to start a new society. This time it was the society to end slavery itself. And some of the people who'd been involved in the original movement were also involved in this one. Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, and a man Zachary Macaulay. What they wanted though was a gradual ending to slavery. They were afraid that people who'd been enslaved for so long wouldn't know how to cope with freedom. So they argued for a gradual process of emancipation. Again, they adopted what the tactics that had been so successful. They had petitions, they had boycotts, they had meetings. Clarkson traveled around the country even though he was much older now. At this stage, William Wilberforce was quite old, and unfortunately, he was very ill. So in 1823, he retired from the British Parliament. 
And this was a major, major loss because who was now going to agitate and bring this agitation directly to politicians in the Westminster Parliament? But Wilberforce's departure coincided with the rise of a new star within abolition. And this new star was a man all Irish people have heard of, a man called Daniel O'Connell. And in future lectures, we're going to come back to look at Daniel O'Connell in more detail. But just very briefly, Daniel O'Connell had been born in Kerry in the west of Ireland in 1775. As a Catholic, he was denied a number of civil rights. And again, something we'll come back to look at, but Ireland had been a colony of Britain for many, many centuries. And even though Catholics were the majority in Ireland, they had systematically been denied basic civil and human rights. If Daniel O'Connell became a lawyer and a very effective lawyer attorney, if he'd been born just a few years earlier, that would not have been possible. So this young Irish lawyer dedicated his adult life to winning rights for equality for Catholics, in which he was successful, and he also dedicated his life to trying to end slavery. But he rejected the idea that enslaved people were not ready for immediate freedom. And so he positioned himself at the radical end of the abolition movement, saying that ending slavery had to be immediate and it had to be total. But he again, just as Equiano had done, he really energized this abolition movement. And after 1829, he became a member of the British Parliament. And as a member of the Parliament, he took up the reins of Wilberforce and he agitated and agitated for slavery to be ended in the British Empire. And finally, in 1833, largely as a result of his efforts, it was decided that slavery would end in the British Empire. But it was a mixed blessing and for Daniel O'Connell it was disappointing because slave owners were given 20 million pounds compensation, the slaves received nothing and also it was believed that the enslaved people couldn't handle freedom immediately so they were forced to endure a period of apprenticeship where in fact they were all but slaves and O'Connell agitated about both of these measures and because, again, of his effective agitation, apprenticeship was brought to an end prematurely in 1837. So, on paper at least, slavery had ended in the British Empire in 1833. Again, it was mixed with some sadness because two days before the act passed, William Wilberforce died. So, after 1833, British abolitionists, they don't go anywhere, but they turn their attention to enslavement in other parts of the world, increasingly in North America, and hence the building of a new transatlantic movement. And so that's what I'm going to end today's lecture. But as I promised, I have created a small list of additional reading, viewing, and listening. If you haven't seen the film Amazing Grace, I would urge you to watch it. It is very, very powerful. And in it, you'll see the people we've talked about today, Wilberforce, Clarkson, Equiano, John Newton. Um, also, maybe, and I don't know if we can end on this, but the song Amazing Grace is particularly powerful at the moment when we're all on lockdown, we're isolated, and we're all worried about our futures. It's a song that is inspirational, and I don't know if any of you saw, but on Sunday, as Easter service could be held in various locations throughout the world, the wonderful singer Andrea Bocelli sang Amazing Grace on the steps of a cathedral in Milan. And again, if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to listen and be inspired and to draw some strength from this song. And again, Peter, I don't know if we can show this song. Christine, I, I'm suspecting that the reason I haven't been able to show these is because I've given the presentation to you. So I'm going to uh, take presentation back and see if I can show these. And I'd invite, uh, I'd invite questions in the meantime. Okay, thank you.
Well, Christine, I've given you back uh, the control of the presentation, and um, I note that we have uh, we have a question. Okay. We have a question. Uh, can I view this at a later time? Yes, the, the video is being recorded, so there is going to be opportunity to uh, to view the uh, to view it later. Uh, send a, an email to museum at kfc.org, and I will be uh, I'll be happy to share it with you. And that seems to be all the other questions. Christine, did you have another slide that you wanted to share? Oh, yes. Um, I started by saying I'm one well, of my great interests, the Irish Farm and the Great Hunger. And I work with a group in Ireland, the Irish Heritage Trust. And they have a great program where they go to various locations where there are Irish communities and they interview people about their memories of emigration and what being an emigrant and immigrant has meant to them. So they should have been in Liverpool in two weeks' time, and they've been to Quinnipiac, but like everybody, they're trying to rethink how they can stay in touch with people, and so they're doing a series of shows with Talkback. And by coincidence, um, this week's show is showing a documentary made by one of my colleagues at Quinnipiac on Irish, the Great Hunger and the Diaspora, and afterwards, my colleague, um, Professor Rebecca Abbott, and myself are going to do talk back. So again, it's all very new, um, but we're doing it, and we're delighted to be you know, helping our friends in Ireland. And I know uh, Peter and the Knights Columbus have given them great support. So you know, that's, I think, one of the inspiring, uplifting things about what we're going through, that people are just showing great kindness and great support to each other. So thank you, thank you for reminding me. Okay, Christine, we have another question. In New England, plenty of mostly affluent people had house servants, slaves, uh, not plantation slavery, but uh, slavery nonetheless. Did Brits keep slaves? And if so, when did that stop? Um, that's a great question. Next week, I'm looking at American abolitionism, so maybe address some of these issues. But there was a very famous um, piece of legislation that's based on law in Britain in 1772, because an escaped slave came to England. And the people who owned him, I use that word advisedly, uh, wanted to take him back. And an abolitionist lawyer, Grenville Sharp, actually instigated a court case to prove that once people were on the soil of British soil anywhere, they could not be slaves. And Equiano was very aware of that and became a friend with Granville Sharp. And so after 1772, slavery could not exist in the British Empire. Ironically, though, there was some slavery within what they called British India. And again, Daniel O'Connor was very involved in trying to end that. But again, if you are able to see the film Amazing Grace, you'll see that it's quite exotic for people who are wealthy in Britain to have people who were black as their slaves. So there's an element of exotica. Um, again, the film is very good in terms of its nuanced view of um, how it approaches the subject. So it was illegal to have slaves within the British Empire um, on that personal level. But yes, slavery did exist, as we know, in the Caribbean and in parts of British India. Excellent, very good. Um, I'm just scrolling to see if we have any. Uh, it is my understanding that Oliver Cromwell sent several thousand Irish women to be bred with slaves in Barbados. Do you know whether that's true? Um, it's true. And again, there's a whole debate, and maybe when in the third presentation, we're going to look more at Ireland. And Ireland is a colony because, as I said, Ireland had been a colony since the 12th century. And nationalists like Daniel O'Connell argued we are slaves, and you know, slaves in a very different way, as Frederick Douglass pointed out. But 
Oliver Cromwell, who is one of the less popular figures um, in Irish history, he came to Ireland in 1649 and he instigated two massacres, men, women and children. And then he tried to, he wanted to reward his soldiers. So he literally just dispossessed the native Irish of their land and he sent thousands of native Irish to the Caribbean. He didn't use the word slaves. And again, you know, this is where definitions are all important, but they were in indentured slaves. So I don't you know what's the distinction, but effectively they had no control over their lives. Um, they were told that at a certain point they could buy back their freedom, but whether or not they did. So yes, Oliver Cromwell certainly did send thousands of Irish people against their will to the Caribbean. Excellent, good, thank you. Any further questions? If not, what I'm going to suggest we do is I will take control once again. And why don't we end with that video that you uh, cited of uh, Bocelli singing uh, on uh, on Easter Sunday, Christine, from Milan. That, that would be I thank lovely. all of you who uh, have joined us today. Again, we'll have uh, two additional presentations from Christine, one a week from today, uh, the 23rd, and then the final one uh, two weeks from today on the 30th of April. Please, uh, if you've enjoyed the lecture, share a uh, word with others so that they can join us as well. Thanks. Bye. And thank you. Thank you.